Hi everyone, this is Desconfiado, and welcome to Singing for Survival, the Capoeira History Podcast. Today's episode is about an extremely interesting character in relatively recent Capoeira history. We'll be traveling back to Rio de Janeiro in the early 1900s, only a few decades after slavery was abolished, and while Capoeira was still explicitly illegal. We're looking at a character who challenged what it meant to be a malandro, and really what it meant to be a man in Brazil at this time. Someone forced to the outskirts of society for who they were, but who nevertheless made a name for themselves that we remember today. A fighter, outlaw, dancer, and singer, this person fully embraced all aspects of who they were. And that's not only incredibly inspiring, but also relates closely to Capoeira philosophies of duality and contradiction. So, without further delay, let's begin our story on João Francisco dos Santos, also known as Madame Isetã. João Francisco dos Santos was born in 1900 in the town of Gloria do Goitá in Pernambuco. This is not even two decades after the abolition of slavery in Brazil, so naturally both of his parents were former slaves. He was one of 17 brothers and sisters, and his father died when he was only seven years old, leaving his mother to fend for the family. And to deal with this, the next year, his mother sold him in exchange for a horse. Like I said, we're really not that far off of when slavery ended, so these kinds of under-the-table, extra-legal slave trades were something that continued to happen. Six months after being sold, João escaped by running away with a woman who offered him work in a boarding house in Rio de Janeiro. João worked at this boarding house until he was 13 years old, at which point he left to live on the streets in the Lapa neighborhood of Rio. The Lapa is a very famous, culture-rich neighborhood in the historic center of Rio's downtown. It's home to some mid-18th century architecture, The most well-known is the Carioca Aqueduct, or the Arcos de Lapa. The Lapa is home to many restaurants, bars, and clubs, which provides many musical outlets for samba, forró, and música popular brasileira. Most importantly, the Lapa has always maintained a bohemian nightlife culture, which has drawn musicians, artists, and intellectuals to the region. While some of the main cultural aspects of the Lapa have stayed pretty consistent, um, the underworld activity has changed significantly since the the period that we're talking about. There's been a lot of reforms to that area that make it, um, I don't know if I want to say gentrified, but but certainly less crime-filled than the time that we're going to be talking about. 
In the early 1900s, the Lapa was the center of clubs, prostitution, and gambling. And for six years, Juan Francisco worked odd jobs in and around the neighborhood. He writes in his memoirs that it was in this bohemian environment of the Lapa that he began to explore his own sexuality. This is the time where uh, where Dos Santos realizes that he's gay and he starts relationships with other young men. Remember that this is early 1900s Brazil, so he does this in a culture that, while it's not explicitly illegal to be gay, um, the, the culture is, is still restrictive on gay people. But in the brothels of the Lapa, Madame's commonly employed young gay men as waiters, cooks, and housekeepers. And so when he was 18, De Santos was hired at one such brothel. It was during this time that Dos Santos started to build his persona as a malandro. The malandro is a very important archetype to Brazilian culture, and particularly to capoeira culture. The malandro is typically described as a bad boy character, a hustler, scoundrel, or trickster, and commonly in Brazil, an anti-hero or folk hero. A malandro could be a con man or a cheater, and is someone who uses cunning, charisma, and wit to manipulate their way to the best possible outcome. But this does not mean that it's inherently a negative archetype, since malandros are often using their cunning to punch up and fight against a unjust system. This is summed up in the, the book O Ultimo Malandro, where author Moreira da Silva defines the malandro as, quote, the cat that eats fish without going to the beach, unquote. Most importantly to our discussion today, the malandro was considered a hyper-masculine archetype in this time and place, with attributes like bravery, virility, and toughness associated with them. In parallel, Dos Santos was also developing his stage persona. He began to perform in a small musical review where he sang and danced dressed in a long red dress and leaving his long hair down to his shoulders. He based his stage persona off acts like Josephine Baker, who was a very successful African-American stage performer in Paris at the time. And now we start to see the beginnings of the duality of Dos Santos's character. He is, at the same time, a hyper-masculine and tough malandro, and an openly gay man who performs in drag. This is the start of him challenging the stereotypes and cultural archetypes of the time. Um, like we were saying, the malandro is, is perceived as someone who is, uh, who is tough, who is, who is the, the man's man, right? And at this time in Brazil, uh, gay men were often stereotyped as being effeminate, as being weak. Um, and Dos Santos is directly combating that, um, with presenting himself in the way that he does and with being open about who he is as a gay man. Unfortunately, Dos Santos's performing career was at least initially cut short. In 1928, he was convicted of killing a security guard who called him a homophobic slur, and this earned him a 10-year jail sentence. In his typical style, he was quoted when asked about this, uh, this killing as saying that he didn't kill the man. He only made a hole in his head, and it was God that killed him. This jail sentence was his first major stay, but not his last. By the end of his life, Dos Santos would spend a total of 27 years in prison for various crimes. And I think this now... Uh, is a good break point in our story, as it kind of divides uh, his life into the, the two major periods that I'd like to talk about. So 
I want to go now to our music selection for the episode, uh, which is by Mestri Tony Vargas, uh, and is a song that includes our our focus for the day, but is also broadly about the Lapa. <laughs> Foi na Lapa, foi na Lapa. Agora eu cortando, tá bom que você grava, foi na Lapa. Ai, ai, ai. Foi na Lapa. So this song is really all about the Lapa. We have references to Madame Iseta, we have references to Manduka da Praia, who someone will talk about in the near future. Uh, it talks about fighting against the police, and um, I think most importantly, uh, it, it talks about the Lapa being the cradle of malandraging, of capoeiraging, um, about it having a history of capoeira, of samba, um, just really emphasizing the importance of the Lapa in, uh, in Brazilian history and really the history of the development of capoeira, particularly capoeira in Rio, which, um, which developed differently than the capoeira of, of Salvador. So we, we mentioned before some of the the cultural significance of the Lapa, the bohemian lifestyle, the um, the existence of lots of style of music, of dance, and it makes sense that this would be the area where we have the development of, of capoeira in Hue, particularly since in the 1900s um, there was a little bit more of the underground scene uh, in the Lapa <clears throat> where we see gambling, prostitution, uh, things like that, and in this time, capoeira is still associated as a criminal activity. It's something that's driven into the outskirts, into that underworld. So um, that's why we would see this close, close association. So now we'll return to our main story after João Francisco got out of prison. And once he was released... Uh, Dos Santos essentially resumed his life as a malandro and drag performer in the Lapa. In 1938, he was convinced by his friends to enter a costume contest during Carnival, which he won with a sequin outfit styled after a bat from the northeast of Brazil. Weeks after this ball, Dos Santos and several other gay men were arrested while walking through a park in downtown Rio. When the booking officer at the station was taking their names, Dos Santos told him that he didn't have one. Because remember, he just got out of prison from his, uh, his 10-year stay for murder there. He has a record, and he's afraid of being jailed again. But as this is happening, one of the arresting officers recognized him from his carnival appearance just a couple weeks before and asked, didn't you win the costume contest dressed up as Madame Seta? So, Madame Seta is a reference to a recently released American film uh, called Madame Satan, which I, I highly, highly recommend you look into it um, like a detailed plot synopsis, because this movie is baffling. It's absolutely bizarre. Um, the, the kind of like really, really, really rough summary is it's about a woman who disguises herself as a seductress named Madame Satan in order to trick her cheating husband all while aboard a party on a Zeppelin. And it's 
much crazier than that that short synopsis sounds so it's definitely worth looking into but that's that's about as much time as i want to give give it in this episode so the the men were released soon after that but the story rapidly spread through the lapa about the uh about one of the arresting officers essentially calling dos santos madame Sata. and as that news spread people started calling him that that became his like new unofficial nickname and and dos santos was initially resistant to this nickname uh in in an interview with him he was he was quoted as saying that uh and i'm paraphrasing that he didn't want to have a a a, quote gay nickname because he thought it was saying too much and he he resisted those who called him by that name but it only made the situation worse and he finally gave into it and and accepted it and and he says about it quote and later comparing my nickname with the nicknames of others i saw that mine was much more beautiful it's very striking end quote Dos Santos would continue his drag performances for many, many years after this, and Madame Iseta was not his only stage persona. Over the years, he developed several others, such as Saint Rita the Coconut Tree uh, and the Wild Pussycat, but Seta was his most well-known persona and the one that he'd be known by. In parallel to his fame as an entertainer, Juan Francisco was also a legendary fighter, and by all accounts, an incredibly skilled capoeirista. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find any information on where he learned capoeira or who from, but nevertheless, it's still a major part of his character and his legacy. His fights with the police were particularly noteworthy as he was said to have often fought barehanded against multiple officers with clubs. One especially fantastic account says that he faced down a 24-man platoon and battled them to a stalemate, forcing them to flee after leaving seven men badly wounded, two with broken arms and two with split livers. So we see now that Dos Santos was legendary for some of the most hyper-masculine elements of being a malandro, his fighting prowess, particularly with a knife, bravery, and his willingness to die for his honor. And he did this while being very openly gay. Like we've said before, in Brazil, homosexuality was popularly associated with effeminacy and passivity, and he clearly broke the stereotype. It's, it's really incredible to imagine the strength of someone uh, to face such powerful societal expectations and still remain 100% genuine to themselves. Dos Santos died in 1976 of lung cancer. And like many important figures in Capoeira history, he died very poor. But very fittingly to his character, He was buried in the traditional malandro attire, a white suit, Panama hat, and a red rose. So this brings us to the end of our timeline on the life of Madame Sita, but I want to talk a little bit more about the meaning or or what we can learn from this. And I want to start with a quote, the most powerful quote I found from from João Francisco, was the following. Quote, I was born an outlaw, that's how I'll live. End quote. Dos Santos was an outlaw in so many ways. He was black, poor, and a gay man. While these things were not explicitly illegal at this time in Brazil, it certainly placed him on the outskirts of society. Slavery was abolished only 12 years before he was born. His parents were former slaves. He himself was sold as property as a child. It's, it's impossible to say that just because 
slavery had been abolished, you know, a little more than a decade before his birth, that that the impacts of slavery and the echoes and continuing of racism in Brazil didn't significantly affect his life. Kind of surprisingly, homosexuality wasn't illegal during his life either, but there were still heavy stigmas and stereotypes against it. We talked a little bit about the stereotypical perceptions of gay men uh, as being effeminate, as being passive, as being weak, um, which were something that he, he had to fight against. And still, he stood against these stigmas to be who he was. A malandro, a drag performer, a capoeirista, and an openly gay man. In the face of these stigmas, this is seemingly contradiction. And Madame Seta faced a whole lot of antagonism because of this perceived contradiction. However, Capoeira has always been full of contradictions. And what we celebrate most about Capoeira is the inherent contradictions that make it so beautiful. The fight and the dance are a, the biggest and most obvious uh, description of that. How those two things interplay, those two seemingly contradictory ideas that we have happen at the same time. And I've heard Capoeira Mestres talk about how the smaller world inside of the Hada is a reflection of the, the larger world outside of that Hada. How it, it be, the Hada becomes a space where we can play out a lot of the conflicts of the real world in, in a place where the typical societal expectations, hierarchies, rules aren't restricting us uh, and in a place that's a little bit more, you know, controlled. And all of this to say that I think Gapwara teaches us that contradictions are not something that should antagonize us, not something that should cause us anxiety, but are often things that we should celebrate and welcome into our lives. And I think that's why Capoeira is something that is so welcoming to so many different people from different walks of life. And that's why I think it's important to learn about, to remember, and to celebrate Madame Isetta. So that brings us to the end of today's episode. I, I really hope you, you learned something and enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed doing the research for this episode. Um, I only had briefly heard about Madame Seta before this, and it was, it was a really great experience for me to find out so much about, uh, about their life that... I find incredibly, incredibly inspiring. And I think that this story is a really important part of, of Capoeira history, particularly the history of Capoeira and Hugh, that we should, we should really think about. So, as always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email them to me. I'll put my email in the description. Uh, if you like these episodes... Please share them with your friends, with your, with your training partners. Um, I'd love to just reach as many people as possible so we can get lots of really great conversations about history going. So thank you very much for sticking around to the end, and I'll see you next time. Sufocá-lo com meus beijos Canto E o homem que eu amo tanto Não me escuta, está dormindo Canto e por fim Nem a lua tem pena de mim Pois ao ver que quem te chama sou eu Entre a neblina 
si esconder.